survive once again. And you are listening to Beyond Sight and Sound, metal detecting treasure hunting radio for you, the always valued and appreciated listener. Uh, hopefully we've got some people coming into the chat. Uh, unfortunately, as many of you may have realized today, uh, shame on me, I did not get a promo out today. Funny story about that, I had full intentions of writing a promo up this morning and putting it out for some open lines, but... There was some other news for me when I got home, and it's it was a long night, a roller coaster morning, and quite simply, I was fixing to write the promo, and I honestly fell asleep in front of the computer. Quite comical. Uh, it does happen. So we'll see what goes on tonight. Uh, we'll see what the listener count turns out like, since there was not an advance notice anywhere. Things you've heard me say before on the show, always keep them guessing. You just, you never know what's going to happen next. And tonight is a very fine example because when it happens, I'll be right there to find out with everyone else. (laughs) But uh, we are in fact back. We appreciate everyone for uh, dropping in who did make it to the show. Uh, I see we've got Swansea in the house, Suki, uh, Past Pursuits. I believe I saw a home finder up in there, so big shout out to him and whoever else may have joined us. Uh, the closest thing that we got to a promo was I did put just a little blip out on a couple groups saying that tonight's show was going to be stories and open lines and that there would be a special mystery person along with me tonight. Who knew who it would be? I guess we'd have to tune in and see. And with that in mind, certainly appreciate him taking the time to to make the show tonight to set in with us. We're crossing borders, continents, oceans, and everything. Time zones. To get to this gentleman and it was very nice of him he actually had to set an alarm it's it's very very <clears throat> late night for him where he is uh, I believe it is uh, almost 2 a.m. in his area but let's go ahead and get him in here some of you already know this gentleman or have heard of him or seen his YouTube videos and we'll give him a chance to uh, mention his YouTube channel and stuff too but setting in with me tonight something a little different coming from the Netherlands it's Mr. Crabinye from YouTube how is it going Danny? I'm doing very fine thank you and thank you for the invitation on the radio show and hello everybody you know it's late at night there for you so that's very cool that that you were actually able to kind of uh drop in and mix things up a little bit for us you're you're very welcome and i'm a sort of night owl sometimes so i don't mind waking up in the middle of the night and it's all about and i do everything for the hobby so right was i correct with that is it like 2 a.m there for you yes uh, exactly to be exact, uh, to be exact, sorry for my English sometimes, 206. Wow. So it really is late at night. Yeah, or early. Uh, depends. Right. Some, some people see the uh, glass half full or empty. Exactly. And uh, would that be, let me see if I've got this straight, because the whole time zone thing confuses me sometimes. That would be 2 a.m. Central European time. Wednesday night into Thursday morning. Yeah, I, I, you're talking to me from the future. Wow! It, it, it's, it's it's Thursday, and you, you guys live in at Wednesday still. Yeah. yeah, it's Wednesday night here. It's Thursday morning there. It's quite funny though. <laughs> I'm talking to the past, and you're talking to the future. Yeah. Wow. 
Too bad we we'll have to figure out a way to get a little further into the future sometime. Maybe somebody can tell me about where that next pull tab is so I don't dig it up. <laughs> <laughs> the evil ones. Exactly. Yes. And uh I believe I even saw uh Craig Stryker and Tar Heel digging in the group, uh Grandma Tam. So we do have a number of listeners coming in. And as I said, I kind of figured that tonight we'd we'd just roll with kind of open lines and stories. Uh, maybe hunters have had something weird happen to them out in the field, strange. Uh, maybe it's an item you dug up. Maybe, uh, like last week, Swansea shared with us that he had been hunting a potato field where a van load of people pulled up and asked him to go to another part of the field because he was actually mashing the potatoes that they could pick up. That's a little weird. You know, I'm I'm sure we've all got some kind of oddball little kind of stories like that. And maybe they may be inclined to uh, call in and share one or two with us. So, for those that would like to, the number is 419-549-5744. Or, maybe you've got a question for Mr. Crabignet. He does a very nice job with his uh, YouTube videos. And you have made a number of very nice finds in your time in the hobby. You've been in the hobby, uh, what, about two and a half, three years? Two and a half years, yeah. Uh... The two and a half years ago, uh, March, I think I started. The, the finds I've been making, it, those are amazing because I've heard stories of people detecting even here in Europe and they didn't find what I found in 10 years time and that's not to show off, but the luck I have with metal detecting, it's unbelievable. And some people might have seen some of my videos and finds and they just keep on coming. Okay, I also have days, of course, I won't find anything good, but we all have them. But oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, 3485, you're on the air with myself and Mr. Crabignet. Hello, gentlemen. This is Craig M. Stryker. How you been? Hey, how's it going, Craig? Good evening. Craig. I, am, I am doing outstanding, sir. If I was any more doing fantastic, I'd wake up face down with my face in the carpet. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that should be it on that one, bro. <laughs> right. I, I I'd like to ask a question of your guest. What uh uh what kind mostly like the ground trash in like the Netherlands is he finding? Is it the same as us or does he find more artifacts than uh clad coins or uh does he hunt in like, you know, a back history of the Netherlands? I'm just curious on what he basically shoots for or what he finds most of. Oh, that's a good question, actually. I mean, because your history does go back quite a ways over there, Danny. Oh, yeah. It, it, it sure does, but I live in the northern part of uh, the Netherlands, and there's an estuary close by, and that reclaimed the, uh, the land throughout the centuries, and we reclaimed the land back. So uh, some parts of the here are uh, mixed up. In some parts you only will find Second World War relics, and some parts you won't find anything at all because these are huge and huge fields. But I use a special map that highlights the most important areas, so I have to ask permission there and hope I get lucky. And I also always listen to the farmers what they have to say about trouble in the fields, because if there are pieces of bricks concentrated, you can bet your ass there's a building remains somewhere deep in the ground there so the yeah, finds will absolutely. be there also so so far um how long have you been detecting so far two and a half years uh okay. two and a half years plus have you got a favorite find yet <laughs> i got many favorite finds sir well uh, there's always one that sticks out <laughs> yeah maybe uh, one kind of uh really jumps to the front of the mind so to speak over the other ones yeah uh, I, I have one in particular, and that is a silver uh, hammered coin. I was lucky oh. to find when I uh, went out to Austria last year, and it depicts uh, uh, the mother of Jesus and Mother Mary, uh, I, I do believe, yeah, because Madonna's yeah. here. Yeah. Mother Mary uh, holding baby Jesus and uh, sitting on his lap, and baby Jesus touching his mother's chin, 
like he's trying to say, Mom, it will all be all right. It's a very wow. emotional picture, and I, 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 it's a radio show. And But if you saw that coin, it's, it's unbelievable, you know. And the piece the coin transmits, it sounds a bit silly, maybe, but... And the thing is, before I found this coin, I found I bought a Jesus crucifix on a flea market, and within one half, two and a half hours, I found a, the coin with pictures of his mother on it, and it gave me goosebumps and uh, it teared me up a little bit. Right, it goes to show that uh, wow. you know, some sometimes there's our our finds uh, can have quite an impact on us in a sense. <laughs> Uh, very big impact in you. Well, I, I appreciate your time and answering my question. And as usual, um, you got a you got a fantastic guest tonight, and uh, as always, a fantastic show. And thanks for taking my call. Oh well, thank you. And thank you for asking the question. And yeah, you guys, have, you, well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, that's okay. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, uh, you know, you have a nice evening, and uh, your guest has a nice morning. <laughs> yes, the the whole past future thing. <laughs> yeah. All right. All thanks right. Lot, well, thanks for the call. You're welcome. Bye bye. And uh, bye -bye. I guess I should mention I did see some people asking in the chat uh, what's what's going on with the Dirt Bandit. Kenny is actually in travel mode. He is on his way back to Mississippi. Uh, family is packed up and rolled out of Missouri today, but there were some very severe storms that they were going through, a lot of miles to go, so there was no way that he was going to be able to make the show tonight. He does want everyone to know, though, he, he's doing well, he's on his way back, he can't wait to get home, and, and here soon, probably next week, we will be seeing an appearance from the Dirt Bandit. Uh, he is not sick, nothing like that. Health is good. Uh, he's just traveling, so that uh, kind of hinders uh, coming along on the excursion for the show. And normally, Chris Engel is always more than willing to set in. All I would have had to have done today was contact him, I'm sure. But we were uh, chatting earlier today, uh, me, Danny, and Diggin' Freedom, and we thought, you know what, how cool would this be? This will really kind of throw people for a loop. Let's get Danny to come along tonight. So that's what we did. Uh, and Kenny is, like I said, he's doing all right. He wants everyone to know that he is on his way back to Mississippi. And I guess along those lines... Interesting story you had about the hammered silver there, Danny. Uh, it, 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 it is a funny story because if you uh, if you buy something religious uh, on a flea market without thinking of it and then come detecting right afterwards and find some some coin like that, it's amazing. And then the other piece I found uh, on the field is uh, a purple bulla seal. That's also a very, very cool find. I was lucky to find the first part. And 16 months later, on the same field, I found the missing other half. So I, I have a complete one now. You know, and, and that's very cool, too, because it goes to show when you find a piece of an item, not, not the whole thing, you only found a piece, and then to be able to recover another section of that item like that, that far in between time... And to know that those two pieces go together, I would think it would almost give the find a little more meaning to the finder. Yeah, it's like the crown on my work so far in the last two and a half years, so to speak. And I'm very proud and to be lucky enough to have found it because it also proves uh, the field I'm hunting uh, once uh, the monastery stood on it and the curator of the Groning Museum uh, yeah, was telling me that was not true. It was a uh, half mile away, but I can dispute it now. Oh yeah, one of those situations where uh, our our finds can help either confirm confirm or even deny at times the activity that went on 
on the sites that we're at. Because yes. sometimes, you know, the the history books may say one thing, and then we find out after we get in there that it may have went down that way, or it may have been something completely different. And uh, you mentioned your hammered silver coin. I know you've made a, a number of other very nice finds, too. Uh, most recently, what, a few months ago, you even dug up a gold coin. Uh, about five, six months ago. Uh, I've been hunting the field uh, continuously as much as I can because there's many goodies on it. And, you know, you, you, you sometimes miss a few uh, inches with swings. Mm -hmm. And I got this jumping signal and it was pretty deep. I think one and a half foot deep. And I dug it up and I flipped the plug, or at least the blubber, because sometimes the fields are are muddy or extremely dry. It's uh, sea uh, clay. And I saw this shimmer of a gold yellow color. And I thought, no way, no way, no way. And, and I took it out and it, it was a gold, of a, a gold hammered coin from 1446, I do believe, if I remember correctly. The coin was struck in the Netherlands, and on the edges of one side, it has uh, the old writing on it. I think it's sort of Latin, and the uh, lettering style is also uh, very old. I can't really describe the, the font of it. And on top, there are two small uh, castle towers with a sort of a, a chapel thing like, uh, and underneath, there's a saint, and underneath, there's a crest with a lion. It's just an, an amazing coin, and it's called a uh, Rijns Goudgulde. I, I saw one on e eBay, uh, sold for $1,535, and it, it's just amazing. It's almost three grams of gold, and I can yeah, listen, listen to the uh, sound of a gold hammered coin. It's awesome. That had to have been a very, very, uh, a, just a, a benchmark of a day for you. Yeah, and in this uh, field that you're hunting, is it, because I'm not real sure how they do that over there, is this like a, uh, say, a rough till field? Uh, yeah, is it, it a plowed field? It's uh, a rough plowed field, a rough tilled field. Uh, it's like a moonscape sometimes. Oh, so that's got to be some tough hunting at times. It's always tough hunting. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's very strange. Uh, the, the farmers here will leave the land tilted or rough plowed for many, many months. And only just a couple of weeks before they reseed it, they will level it out. So I'll always enjoy the few last weeks, but it always gets me sad because I know the fields will get seeded and I won't be able to detect for four, five, six months, depending on which crop is on the field. And my honey hole field, as I call it, where I found the gold hammered coin also, it's shut for three years. I, I can only detect it now when the yeah, the grass mixture that's on it is uh, mowed and it will be plowed again in three years' time. But that kind of ma makes me wonder what, what I'll find next there. But it's, it's good, you know, it, it, it keeps you uh, awake. And in the meanwhile, I can go hunt some other awesome permissions I have. Right. And what is the uh, the ground mineralization like there? Do you guys have a lot of issues in that area? Uh, it depends. Uh, it's a good question you ask that because uh, I do have sometimes trouble on certain spots because of the high uh, salt level, I think, because it was once uh, sea bottom here. Mm -hmm. so the mineralization in the sea clay can some sometimes be higher uh, right. in one place than on another place. And my machine is a white M6, and it has a beach detecting mode, but I don't use it on land because the mineralization isn't high enough. And I, yeah, after two and a half years, I, I know what a false signal is from the machine and not. But you never know. Uh, right. So you put that time out in the field with the machine, so you know what it's telling you. It, uh, you, you. Uh, You've become very accustomed to it. Also, I'd like to uh, point out, big shout out, I see that uh, Detect America has actually dropped into the chat. Uh, for those who ha may not have noticed the promo, 
there was a technical issue last night, I guess, and they will be running WNL tonight. So, once again, it's one of those uh, double shots for the listeners. They get a dose of Beyond Sight and Sound, and then they get Detect America's WNL. So that'll definitely be very cool. And we're also joined by another caller. Go ahead, caller. Who do we have? Hey, Josh, and hey, Danny. How are you? Long time no talk to you. Hey, Swansea. Uh, it's been about 25 minutes, I guess. But, Danny, I have a couple <laughs> questions for you. One that I didn't ask you earlier was, where does Mr. Crabbenay come from? <laughs> uh, you remember the, the time uh, the CBs were uh, all around in the late se- in the 70s, 80s, and uh, people had uh, call names? Oh, oh yeah, they're, yeah, they're CB uh, handles or call yeah. signs. Because everybody was, uh, yeah, it has a metal detecting name, uh, like Treasure Seeker or, or, you know, and I'm kind of different, so I thought, uh, let, let's look for different names. And I just happened to stumble on a voodoo site, and it, I don't, I'm not a black magician or a voodoo guy or something, but you have all these voodoo gods. And one description of one food of God, I think that comes close to my personal character. That is uh, Loa Krabine. So I uh, I chose that name and uh, I put in Krabine and YouTube put on Mister. So it's Mister Krabine from since. And I kind of <laughs> oh, that's great. I like the name. What? And in Dutch, when you uh, take part of word crab in a. Uh, it means uh, crap in egg, or crap in egg. So it's, it's kind of funny. It, it's all about the fun, funny. you know. Right. Got to have fun with it. And, and then, my uh, other question for you, Danny, is how much American coin do you find over there? Oh, <laughs> that's funny. Um, the field, I found my gold hammered coin in. I also found, found the war dime. A uh, silver U.S. war dime. Uh, I do believe it was a 1942 one. So that oh, was uh, a mercury dime. Yeah, so that was quite uh, good fun finding a U.S. dime on a field in the middle of nowhere. I think an uh, American soldier must have lost that in the Second World War. Yeah, it kind of makes you wonder. Good grief! How did this get here? <laughs> yeah, and I also found a half of a T4 key on that same field. Oh wow! Uh, it, it, it's strange sometimes that you, you you expect on a certain field because you have found so many finds of a certain period or era, and, and then suddenly <laughs> an American coin pops up. <laughs> but would that now when you're saying that you said you found the uh, the gold coin there in that same field that you find a 1942 silver coin from the United States? When you dug that out of the ground, were you thinking? This is a bunch of crap, like where we find modern clad, or were you thinking this is kind of a neat find? Oh, uh, I f- think every find is a neat find. Even coins from the 90s can be neat, you know. And it's not that you have to try and dig the old stuff. Of uh, you, you just have to wait what you will pick up out of the dirt, and uh, depending on the field and situation. You know what to expect, but not really. It's almost like one of those Kinder eggs. You you, you know there's a surprise in it, but you not, don't know if you're going to like the surprise or not. <laughs> nice. That's a good way to put it. There, yep, There's a lot of answer. truth there. Because every target we recover, it's like opening up a new gift. When, when we cut that plug, and we may have a good idea of what it's going to be, but we're never... You know, you can't always be a hundred percent certain, and then you get it out of the ground, and the realization sets in, and you're like, "Oh yeah," or "Oh man, buzzkill." <laughs> yeah, yeah, because on the side of those fields, there are, uh, yeah, of course, there's roads here, and they, the people, uh, yeah, throw the trash sadly away in in the side of, of the side of the road, and then the uh, grass gets uh, cut, and then the can slow goes also uh, into the field and the first 20 yards of the field uh, you find more rubbish than further away from the road and, and I try to avoid most cancel but I also want to clean out the field so I dig everything off the 
field, even the, the iron, so I can get to the goodies. And everybody right. should always do this if they have a honey hole. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Clean it out, find those good targets. You never know what the other items are masking. And what I also like want to add is keep your eyes always on the ground when you sw swing the coil because you never know what kind of eye finds are around. I found I found a handful of uh, clay marbles and they date uh, the, the date range uh, just from uh, medieval periods to 1700s, 1800s. So those were hand rolled uh, baked clay marbles. Wow. Yeah. Those are always neat to find, too. And from different pictures that I've seen of people posting them that they've found them, you got to kind of admire it, because a lot of them really are made very, very round. They're not, you know, misshapen or anything. And you got to kind of wonder, how did they manage to do that, but yet keep everything so exact? A lot of patience and practice, I think. Well, that could be. Because I also have a uh, one-inch white clay marble, or maybe the, it's only the outer layer that's a little bit white, and it's like almost a small moon. It's not uh, so smooth, but it's still round, but it, I, it, uh, it looks a bit funny, almost with craters in it. But I, I wonder how which kid played with it and when lost, you know? Oh, yeah, exactly. Uh, and I imagine that that you're finding these probably in different sizes. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, the biggest uh, one, uh, it's not complete, sadly enough. I thought it, I, I had found a small clay cannonball, but it was glazed. And I think it's almost three inches across. So wow. They used to play with big marbles also. And I found a... Uh, so smaller sizes, two inch, uh, one inch, and the, the smallest uh, ones I found more. I found about eight or nine of them. Those are only half an inch. Oh, wow. I can try to fetch them, and the, the sound of them is also very uh, nice. Hmm. Now, being where you're located, what is, say, your oldest find? Ooh. Oh, yeah. that's a difficult one because I, I could, uh, yeah, the only finds I can really say are the oldest finds are the medieval coins I have found because you, you can determinate them. Uh, so that's 1400s. Uh, I, I haven't gotten back uh, much deeper in time so far. M maybe I have a relic that's older, but then I, I, I don't know yet. That's... Uh, with metal detecting finds, and I also have an eye finds only, and that's an uh, fist X, and that's from the Neolithic time. Th oh, that's an amazing find, and I also have found a uh, grinding stone to uh, grind up corn or uh, or uh, maize. I don't know which what they use. Most likely a cor corn or a grain. Right. And that, that and I think it's only the third one ever found in this province. Oh wow. So uh there's a good possibility that some of your finds could even be quite rare. Yes, they are quite rare. And but it will take you a lot of work to to, to collect those uh and you just have to persevere. Is that the correct word? Yeah. Yeah, you you've got to persevere, be uh persistent, determined. Patient, <laughs> and and still be lucky enough to get your coil over the target. Uh, l luckily, yeah, I, I have a good machine, and I don't have a golf swing. <laughs> so some people swing their machines like they are playing midget golf, right? Uh, and you know. and they wonder why don't I find <laughs> as much as other people do? Exactly. When you're when you're swinging your coil like that, you're missing a lot more targets than what you can even begin to guess. An amazing amount. And I've gathered a few of the clay marbles, and I'm holding one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, ten in my hand now. And that's what they sound like if you uh, toss them around a little bit. Oh wow! So it, it even almost sounds like the uh the glass marbles of today yeah 
th they are also the same uh, yeah, weight, I think. A and the colors different a little bit. They all uh, yeah, dark uh, gray shaded, but the w they have lighter gray shade. I also have uh, two that are almost black. One is uh, sort of gold brownish. It, it, it's just wow. And these, I'm assuming, you are primarily picking up uh, out of the fields. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's an odd round shape you find because we don't have uh, many pebbles or uh, small stones in, in the clay here. And if they are, they are not fully round as the marbles. So the round mar marbles will stick out to you. And that's why you have to keep your eyes open. And sometimes you can only see a, a few millimeters of them. But when you have found a metal uh, object and you kneel down, you, you see uh, out of the corner of your eye something different. And I just go for it and, and try to pick it up. We have uh, loads of uh, clay pipe pieces here also. And I, I found thousands of pieces. Really, I, I have a bag full that weighs a couple of kilos. Sometimes you find the the, um, the heads of the pipes, but most of the times they are broken up because of the plow. Uh, the stems are longer than two, three inches most of the time because they're very, very delicate. So when the dirt gets moved around, they just stick and snap. But I, I try to pick up as many as I can because on some there are letterings and some have decorations on them. Oh, well, that would definitely be neat. Uh, I found one. It's uh, it said for the nut van het algemeen, meaning for the, the benefit for all. I think so. That was uh, to try out the level, the rich and the poor uh, level. So so people were more equal. And I do believe that is early 1800s. So that the pipes can differ also, but you can see from if you find on the head of a clay pipe, if it's a small pipe. Yeah, it's uh, an older one than the newer ones because uh, when tobacco was introduced, it was a uh, high commodity uh, thing and very uh, expensive. Right, so very you, you all, uh, Yeah, so you uh, only used a little bit of tobacco and later on it was cheaper, so the, the, the pipes were also bigger. Right, it started to uh, become a little more... Uh widespread so to speak yeah. the use and, of it uh, you could buy those pipes pre-stuffed so you only smoked one pipe one time and when the pipe was empty you j just tossed it away so they are kind of the cig cigarette butts of those days right exactly the the uh the uh, discarded cigarette butts of uh the historic past in a sense have you ever been fortunate enough to find one intact Oh, no, 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 it, uh, I, I don't think I'll, I'll find a whole one on these fields because the, the farmers really race on the field and the plows are pretty deep set. So the chances of a delicate object like that surviving here are very, very slim. Right. Uh, but, are, are the coins that you recover off of these fields, are they normally in decent shape or are they pretty beat up from the plows? No, the, 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 the coins are mostly pretty nice. Sadly, the gold coin has a little scratch on it, but um, the most other coins I find are in pretty decent shape, uh, uh, except for most of the copper, uh, because copper gets deteriorated, of course, more by the minerals and the acidity. Right, sometimes uh, they don't hold up real good in the ground. Uh, and this also can vary, uh, so 20 yards from a certain spot, you, you are able to find the coins in a bit more a better state than the others. Because with the, the popal seal bits I found, one was uh, more corroded than the other one, and I found it almost 50 or 80 yards further from the other piece. Right. It goes to show how fast uh, ground conditions can change from one spot to another. You know, you, you could be in one spot that it's it's the ground is not too bad at all, and then move over 10 feet, and... You know, there you go. You're into some some bad ground. And sometimes, because of the sea clay, the the coins have been uh, yeah, cut off of air, and those uh, are mostly the better co copper hammered coins I found. Because right. uh, I, I can say I found a hoard on that field. Uh, I think I must have dug over a hundred copper coins from the 1700s there. Wow. 
Man, uh, I, just the fines that you guys make over there are, to recover the the history that dates that far back has really got to be an experience. It sure is, and I I envy uh, sort of the people that are able to find Roman because we didn't have Roman activity here. But maybe there's Viking or Celtic stuff around here. I'm not sure because I live pretty close to Denmark and Sweden. Mm -hmm. so, so cross your fingers, I'll be able to show you a, a good relic from that era one day. Oh yeah, now how cool would that be? <laughs> yeah, that would be <laughs> totally awesome. Uh, and I, I won't complain about all my other finds, but, but finding something Viking, wow. You know, that brings up an interesting question too. Uh, sometimes with, with people that have been on the show, we talk, like here in the States, about bucket lists a list of items that we would like to be able to find you know we can say oh hey we knocked one off the list today you know I've always wanted to find a gold ring and I found one or a gold coin or whatever the case may be do you guys over there like in in the Netherlands do that sort of stuff too where you've got say a certain list of things that you would like to be able to find in the hobby like you were mentioning there could be some some Celtic around or something like that uh, my, uh, my my highest wish list the bucket list thing is a bronze bronze, bronze a HX hat oh uh, and I'm lucky enough uh, to have found a decent area where they have found burial mounds and fields surrounding it uh, I can maybe detect. I already have one small permission from one farmer, but if you have one permission, most uh, of the times it will lead on to another and another. You just have to show yourself and be polite, smile and ask. Never right. hurts to ask. Do you find, because I'm sure there's probably detecting tours and stuff like that in that area, quite possibly. Do you find that because of these, say, group tours or anything like that that it's hard to obtain permission in certain areas i'm lucky enough that isn't uh, the question here there are tours in the netherlands and uh, clubs club dicks but not where i live i don't know why but it's just like that maybe because the fields are uh, not covered with fields like in other provinces of this uh, country and maybe i should do that someday if i have enough permissions and can talk the farmers into it, let people, um, or more than one person, walk on their fields. Yeah, that could be an idea, especially if there's nobody else doing it in that area. Uh, but, but maybe people can chip in a, a few bucks if they join and we can buy the farmer a, a couple of drinks or something like that. You know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely a nice idea. Very, uh, very thoughtful. I, I do that sometimes. Depends on the farmer and where I am. I buy uh, the farmer's wife uh, a bunch of flowers, or, or what I ask it if they do they drink. So uh, I, I walk on the fields. It's it's sort of honor for me to be able to dig their land because it's their property, and I respect their property. And I was uh, leave it as I, I I found it because you, you know there's still diggers around that don't fill up their holes. Right, that's a very good point. Unfortunately, there are, and there's some people that. You know, they kind of look at it as, oh, it's just a field. I ain't got to worry about filling the hole in. But really, the the ethics should be the same across the board. Whether you're in a field, a park, the woods, it doesn't take but a second. You know, fill your holes. Just kick in the dirt, stamp on it twice, and you're done. Right. Have you ever... Uh, ran across the situation where maybe the property owner would like some of the fines or do you uh, just as a gesture give them some of the fines? Uh, when, when I ask permission I always say to the farmers that they can have everything uh, uh, but most of them don't care that they just want to see some of them of some people are so busy they just don't care and they're glad you are able to walk the fields and have fun and so, so they're pretty lenient here. And some of the farmers, uh, they have more workers. So I go out to the bakery and get them some uh, cupcakes or something like that. 
they always love that. But. Yeah, very nice gesture, absolutely. And it's uh, not, not not many people know I do this. I don't talk about it, but I think it's pretty normal to do that because they give you a, a sort of favor, so I return the favor. Mm hmm. And really. Those little gestures like that could go a long way at paving the road for other permissions. You know, that landowner may talk to his friend down the road or something and say, Oh yeah, Danny's a great guy and, you know, maybe he should come hunt your property. So sometimes it works like that, but most of the time I gain new permissions when I uh, hunt in the in the winter times and or in the autumn or fall. And uh, spring, uh, then I see another farmer on the neighboring fields, and I just uh, walk over to them and introduce myself, because somehow, if you are on a field of a neighbor of the farmer, uh, they d don't get spooked, because if you just uh, see a farmer and you stop with the car, then the farmer will think, "What? Who's that person? What does he want to you know?" But if he sees you walking on the field and he has seen you a couple of times before, he thinks, oh, that's this crazy guy that looks for uh, <laughs> yeah, this is stuff in the ground, you know. Because right. most most people have not have a clue what you are able to find sometimes. Right. Uh, I just happened to notice we got a question in the live chat, which is, it's hard for me to keep track of it sometimes, but I did just spot that one from Past Pursuits. He'd like to know if there are places in the Netherlands that are completely off limits for metal detecting, like, you know, certain areas that you you absolutely don't go, otherwise you could wind up being arrested or something like that, you know, there's restrictions there. Is there any place like that in the Netherlands? Yes, there are many of those places, luckily enough, to protect the, the, the grounds and the, the relics in it. Because otherwise, people would uh, uh, pirate it, as I call it, or plunder it. Right. Uh, I have one uh, permission. It's close to uh, one of those sites that's off limits. It's uh, in Germany. It's a fortress. But uh, adjuncting to that uh, fortress, there are, it's surrounded by fields. And I got two thirds of those fields uh, permissions of already. And uh, I found 300 musket bullets in three days there wow so it's chances amazing. are good that that has not been hunted much how it, it, it isn't hunted the surrounding fields I, I know for a fact some people have gone on the fortress fortress site but it's been covered up by a layer of dirt and sand to protect the the, the fortress uh -huh. and they did a do a dig in 2012 i believe and some earlier digs, and they found a substantial um, uh, amount of relics and uh, even a leather shoe and a huge trebuchet bomb. Uh, I think that one was almost one half foot in diam diameter, and it's a hollow uh, bomb, uh, cast iron, one inch thick, and was filled with uh, gunpowder with a wooden fuse. And uh, that it, they would lit a fuse when it was in the trebuchet and hope it would explode just above the fort or in the fort. And it would make a real mess of it because I found some shrapnel of those trebuchet uh, cannonballs, so to speak. And that you, you don't like those pieces. They weigh so much. And it's not like small shrapnel pieces of, of Second World War bombs. The, the, these pieces can kill a couple of elephants, you know? Wow. Out of curiosity, too, being over there, I'm sure you're, they've got uh, some sort of, like, treasure trove act and stuff like that. Say you would find six gold coins or or a, a Kelty cord. What is the proper procedure that you would have to go through? Hey. I only know that if you make a substantial find like that, you have to report it within three days. But uh, I told the, on the show before, I found a grinding stone, and I reported that last year, and they haven't re uh, returned any calls. So I wonder if that trophy system works here. Uh, I, 
I do my best, you know, and but I know in England it works very well and it gets right. a conserved, uh, a preserved for, for the future generations and put into uh, yeah, uh, museums, etc. I had bad experiences with it uh, because I have tried and but they just put me down, uh, so to speak, because they don't think of me as a serious person, maybe. Right, but, uh, yeah. kind of like, don't bother us. <laughs> yeah, and it kind of let me down. But I, I still have uh, good uh, yeah, energy in myself, so I, I'll, I'll just think, when, okay, it's not my problem at the moment, because I can save up the relics, uh, especially for my honey hole, and I'm thinking about it for more than a year, maybe some, uh, maybe write a short story, a, a thin booklet about it, with all the pictures of the finds. Oh, there you go. That would be kind of interesting. And then uh, make a little more income so I can buy maybe a better machine. Right. Which, uh, that, that brings up a good question. You have been very, uh, very satisfied with the performance of your M6. If you had the choice of a different machine, you know, you could go out and just buy whatever machine you would like to have. Is there a particular one in mind? Would you stick with whites? Uh, maybe you'd try Garrett XP? I'd love to try another machine. And I don't know yet. There's so many. And the new generation of machines that is there and are coming, those are also maybe better i don't know I, i've known uh, of i heard from persons that uh, white's m6 is just uh, a good classic and will always be formed not watertight you know it, you cannot like the 80 pro put it under water and that's the only downside in my, my world because sometimes it rains so hard i have to take cover and protect the machine i i i've met i've yeah, already made it a bit more waterproof than normal but yeah, I, I love the machine. I, I don't like all the knobs and dits and deaths, you know. It has a, a seven tone mode and it works like a charm. Maybe it doesn't have, have the depth like other machines, but, but it, I love it. It's a bulky machine maybe. It's, but it's sturdy. The battery is, uh, lasts pretty long. L look what it gave me already. So I yeah, can't. I was going to say, look at the finds you've made though. So, even if it may not necessarily go as deep as another machine, it seems to be going deep enough for you. <laughs> it's it's one of those things where you just you have to find what works for you in your particular style of hunting and stuff. And it sounds like the M6 has done well. Is that the first machine that you purchased, or did you get into the hobby with a different machine and move to the M6? Uh, when I was 16, I bought a... a Dirt, dirt as machine from a radio shack or a tendy mm -hmm. and I used it and in the first day I found a handful of uh, bullet tips from second world war and after about four or five hours into the hunt uh, we moved to a different location I found a live hand grenade okay. uh, <laughs> and we informed uh, the, the ED right. and, and they came and the police came and they that they exploded uh, of yeah just put a hand grenade in the hole and they exploded the hand grenade uh, but the police told me off and my parents got mad at me because I might have died doing that so it uh, shook me up a little bit and I thought okay if this hobby gets me in trouble I won't do it again so I didn't do it again till two and a half years again. Uh, ago, and, and I, I wish I never stopped since I was 16, because imagine the fines I would have. Oh, yeah, you kind of sat back going, man, what, look at the stuff that I may have been missing, you know, the the fines that I could have had now, why did I stop? But but even with the, the small, cheap one, I, I was able to be lucky in that one day, I also found a bronze age uh, arrowhead, and then a spearhead. Wow. So I, I did pretty well on my first day of metal detecting. So if I look back to it now, maybe it was uh, my destiny almost. Mm -hmm. I, I, I never had so much luck in my la life, uh, like in the last two and a half years with metal detecting. And it really makes me happy and feel at ease. And 
I feel at peace with myself and my situation. And I love being outdoors, hearing the birds, smelling the sounds, uh, digging in the dirt. Even if there's fresh manure on it, I don't care. I, I just love it. It's, uh, it's Maybe it's a boy's thing, playing in the dirt. I don't know. Right. And we are joined by another caller, Mr. Chris Engel. How goes Hello, it, sir? Hello, Mr. Josh. Hello, Danny. Hello. Good evening. Really have enjoyed the uh, show tonight. I've got a question for you, Danny. Being that the Netherlands was occupied by the German army and then after that basically the U.S. army, do you find, or the places you go, do you find a lot of different World War II relics also? I, I do find a lot of shrapnel, or not a lot of shrapnel, but I do find occasionally shrapnel and mortar sh shards and other things, but so far I wasn't able to really uh, find a, a badge or something like that because the, the activity, you have to uh, go back in books, and I'm not really a Second World War uh, relic hunter, I, I rather go further back in time and most of the times on the fields where those things are I do find uh -huh. some bullet casings but th there were no battles there uh, I do have a permission in Germany in a private forest and I know for a fact uh, the Polish and the Canadian have fought the Germans there and I do find uh, more relics there also second world war points with a swastika on it maybe one day I hope to find something like a dog tag or an officer's badge or a hat badge or something like that. Okay, well, that's interesting because, I, I, you know, you were talking about the Netherlands and, of course, I like World War II also, and I, you know, I noticed those regions over there and from where you're at, it seemed like it was very close to a lot of the action also. But that was my question. But anyway, thank you very much for answering, Danny, and great show tonight, Josh. Well, thank you. Uh, and thank you for dropping by and asking the question. Okay, and we'll take care, and you know, have a good one. All Thank right. You, sir. Bye-bye. Well, let's see here. Uh, for for those that have been following the show for a while, they know that the wild card entries are still running. Let's give out a wild card entry to the first caller with the correct answer to what earlier in the show Danny said there was an item, a particular item that was high on his list of bucket finds. What was that item he mentioned? 419-549-5744. First caller with the correct answer walks away with a wild card entry. And we'll see if anybody happened to catch what that find was. Or the, the find that you would like to make, I'll, I'll say. And uh, let's see here. It looks like we may have someone calling in. It's Mr. Chris Ingle again. Yeah, and I've, I've kind of caught the show off and on because I've been having to take work home with me. What was it, a bronze axe head? Why, yes, sure. it was. <laughs> and I sure go. hope I'll be able to find it. Because well, I hope you do too, best. Danny. I'll keep my fingers crossed for you. I hope you do find it. Oh, thank you, sir. Okay, well, well let's, we'll get off here, Josh. I know you all kind of pressed for time. Oh, yes, and, and we've got uh, Detect America going to be doing their WNL tonight, so we don't want to run on for too long. Yeah, okay, take care. You too. Bye -bye. Well, that was, that was, that was quick. So people are paying attention. And that's Luckily. the thing. You just never know what's going to happen next around here. We are kind of uh, running, running close to the end of our rope for tonight, Danny. And I'm sure it's uh, getting late for you there as well. But before you go, is there, would you like to let people know where they can find you on, say, YouTube and Facebook? Uh, yeah, uh, on YouTube, uh, my channel is Mr. Krebine, so M-R-K-R-K-R-A-B-I-N-A-Y, -R uh, and on Facebook, you can find me on Danny Goghe, D-A-N-N-Y-K-O-G-H-E-E, -E. so if you want to add me, try, and I'll see you, uh, if, if friendship request is there, and if you want to watch my videos, uh, my channel is locked up at the moment. I only have five videos available, but I will change it later on. It was due to circumstances. I had to do something like that. But right. it will be reopened shortly. So then you will be able to watch over 160 videos with finds. And some very good videos at that. Some nice finds. 
Uh, also, I would like to mention to people, if they haven't noticed, there has been a link being shared around of a GoFundMe uh, for Swansea's sister. Their father suffered a stroke, and they are trying to get Swansea's sister out there so that there is family in the area, since there are no relatives out there. People aren't asking for a whole lot. They're just trying to get, trying to help with the cost of a, a plane ticket to get her there. If anyone would be inclined to uh, maybe donate a couple of dollars, you know, every little bit adds up. Whether it's a dollar, two dollars, five dollars, uh, the option is there. If you haven't seen the link, you can find it on the Metal Detecting Beyond Sight and Sound Facebook group. Uh, you can find it on my timeline, Josh Kimmel, on Facebook. You can find it on uh, Swansea's timeline. A number of people have shared it. Uh, Craig Stryker has, I know. It's it's just unfortunate, and, and we are keeping their uh, family in our thoughts. Uh, we wish them the best of luck. On, on another note, if uh, you happen to get onto the Beyond Sight and Sound group on Facebook, or even on my timeline, I know it hit a number of places this morning, uh, quite a nice little uh, article was done up. Uh, it, it actually posted this morning on the MindLab website on their news feed. Uh, feel free to drop in, check it out. Let me know your thoughts on it. Feel free to share it. I thought it was very nicely done. And next week, we should have the Dirt Bandit back again. Should be some interesting stories. For everyone else, I certainly hope that you enjoyed the show. Uh, sorry for the late notice, no promo, but that will be rectified. We will be back on track next week with none other than C.T. Todd. Todd Yerkes, uh, doing a show about permissions, tips, techniques. Uh, we may even speak a little bit about the Deus and CTX boot camps that he helped Sandy Savage with. And we will probably open that show a little differently. We'll probably open that show with a cold knock scenario. Just to kind of give some people an idea of how that sort of thing goes if they've never had any experience with it or very little experience with it. So for everyone else, we certainly appreciate you tuning in and dropping by. If uh, you enjoyed the show, by all means, please like, rate the channel. That keeps the giveaways rolling. We love to see the support. Uh, we always appreciate the listeners, and the wild card entries will continue. Keep an eye on the Metal Detecting Beyond Sight and Sound Facebook group. Probably sometime over the weekend, I'll launch uh, a few ways to gain a couple more wildcard entries before we close that out, and that winner will be announced next week. Don't forget, Detect America, WNL, on live stream. Check it out. Those guys usually put on a very, very nicely done show. And we uh, we appreciate the cooperation and support from them as well. Uh, being able to give the listeners a double shot like that tonight, very, very cool. And speaking of uh, cooperation and support, soon there will be, sometime in the near future, another show on cleaning fines by electrolysis. And there will be a giveaway, an in-series electrolysis unit up for grabs from Detect America. So special thanks to them for that. Big shout out to them. Appreciation for all the listeners who did tune in. We got a roll, folks. Hang in there with me, Danny. And for everyone else, well, we'll see you next week.